Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2018. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family. And featured speaker, Ty Gibson. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Hello and welcome to our number three of our opening night sitting at 3ABN Fall Camp Meeting 2018. And God has been here in a mighty and strong way. And we praise the Lord for his power and his presence. We have the pleasure this evening of sitting under the ministry during this hour of Pastor Ty Gibson. And he carries a strong portfolio as co-founder and director of Light Bears Ministry preacher, teacher of the word, and also he adds to that portfolio, pastor. This idea of covenant identity is one that excites us all, and we will begin to wend our way through that this evening as we listen to him speak. We have sort of watched Ty grow up on 3ABN. When he was younger, you remember, he used to have a big, thick beard, and it made him look older. Now, of course, as he's gotten older, he wants to look younger, as we all do. So the beard is gone, and we get to see that handsome face and hear his wonderful voice. God has a message to give to us, so we ask that you give attentive ear and listen carefully as you experience some what might be new information or information that has been around for a while but that has been mined and now comes to us in a new and fresh way. Uh, he is the husband of one wife, Sue, and the father of three grown children. He still looks pretty good for an older fella, and God has blessed him to study the Word and to be a great student of the Word. So I'm excited to hear him this very night. Uh, before he comes to us and gives us his message, we are going to be favored with a selection by uh, our friend and pastor, John Lomacang. Would you now bow your head with me as we pray, followed by Pastor John, followed by our speaker for the evening, Pastor Ty Gibson. Shall we pray? Dear Father, be pleased now to speak to him so that he can speak to us of your words. Bless this music that shall be sung. May it be water to our thirsty souls. And then bless the word that shall be spoken. May it fill us and nourish us and help fit us for heavenly habitation. We praise you. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I would love to be able to sing like that. I would max out my credit card and pay monthly payments to the second coming if I could sing like that. Seriously, what a blessing. It's good to be here. I'm so happy to be here. According to my memory, the last time I had the privilege of being here at 3ABN was in 2014. That's four years ago. Four years ago. It just feels good, really good to be here with you and to get into God's Word. Now, I want to give you a warning ahead of time, all right? I'm going to give you this warning by telling you something that happened to me a few years ago. It came to my mind, I remembered it, and it's a perfect metaphor for what we're about to do. I walked into my friend's house. We were about to have a discussion. His wife came out of the kitchen with a platter covered with something that looked delightful. She said, would you like a bite-sized blueberry muffin? I said, as a matter of fact, I would. So I took one, and I inserted it in my mouth. I chewed it up. I swallowed. She just stood there staring at me without blinking, as if I did something wrong. She said, would you like another? I said, actually, yeah. <laughs> so I took another one, put it in my mouth, chewed it up, swallowed. Number two, gone. She said, you're putting the whole thing in your mouth at once. I said, did you not say that they are bite-sized <laughs> blueberry muffins? She said, yes, but... I said, well, but what? Show me how it's done. So she took one in hand. She took a little, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a bite, maybe a nibble. It took her three, four, five nibbles to eat a bite-sized blueberry muffin. <laughs> and I walked away from that experience saying to myself, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are big bite people and there are little bite people. 
And I guess I'm a big bite person. And I'm going to ask you tonight to be a big bite person, Bible study wise. We're going to put the whole thing in our mouth and we're going to chew and chew. And I don't know, maybe they're, maybe they're whole wheat blueberry. The ones I had were not. They were too good. They were not whole wheat. <laughs> but this is going to be, this is going to be like, whole food blueberry muffin Bible study. I'm going to ask you to dig into the word with me, but I'm going to ask you to take in a lot of information. Are you ready? Are you ready to do this? Are the rest of you ready to do this? Okay, so we're going to dig into the word and we're going to take this in two parts, okay? Just two parts. Because we're launching our little series right now, I say little series, my little part in this camp meeting, I've got four sessions with you. And my four sessions are going to be dealing very specifically with the concept of covenant identity. Now, if that language is not super familiar to you, I am hoping, I am praying by the grace of God that you will not only become familiar with this language, but that you will adopt this language in your view of yourself and your view of God, and you'll see what I mean by that as we jump into the material. Now, we're going to take it in two parts tonight. First of all, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction that I think is helpful, something that I remind myself of frequently, and I want to remind you of this as well. You are no doubt aware, because here you are tonight at 3ABN Homecoming Camp Meeting, you are aware that something very, very important is going down in human history right now. We happen to live in the most crucial period of human history. Now, there's something called eschatological Bible prophecy. That's end time Bible prophecy. The eschaton is the end of time. And something is brought to view in Bible prophecy that we need to remind ourselves of over and over again. There are all kinds of components to end time, eschatological Bible prophecy. But there's one piece that is at the climactic, the pinnacle of end time Bible prophecy. It is the lever, if you will. It's the catalyst. It is the event or process that actually initiates or sets in motion a series of events that brings on the second coming of Jesus. This is the crucial event. I'm going to call it a revolution. Now, the word revolution, you hear the word rev revolve there. It means to overturn some existing system and to replace it with some kind of new system. Are you tracking with me? That's just the etymology of the word, the definition of the word. A revolution is the overturning of an existing system and replacing it with some new system. You with me so far? All right. So, for example, in the world of politics, the word revolution, political revolutions, would be in language you've heard like the French Revolution. That was a political, social revolution. The Russian Revolution, the American Revolution... The word is used for political upheavals. The word is also used for seismic changes in economics and in the way people process information and produce money and cash flow, as in, language you've heard, the industrial revolution or the technological, what? Revolution, right? But the word is also used with regards to the way people process reality, the way people think about the composition of reality itself, the way people think, as in the term you've heard, no doubt, the scientific, what? Revolution. People's way of viewing the world and themselves completely upended. Scientific revolution. Now, the Bible actually prophesies a revolution. You may be familiar with these words. I think many of you, if not all of you, are. Revelation 18, verse 1, prophesies, foretells something that is going to happen, a revolution. After these things, John said, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Now, note the language. And it says, having great, what? 
authority or power in the King James Version. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now watch what happens in the next verse. Verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice and he said something. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So we have some kind of something that is described as a kind of glory illumination that goes global. The whole earth is lightened with his glory, right? That overturns an existing prevailing system called Babylon. Babylon is the system that needs to be upended, overturned, defeated. And Babylon is a way of thinking, as you'll see in just a moment. So there are four elements to this eschatological prophecy. In the prophecy, we see power, glory, illumination, and Babylon. Power in this text is not referring to the power of force or coercion. It's referring to the power of attraction, credibility. It's referring to the kind of power that is exerted when you capture someone's attention and they lean in, they listen. Sometimes we refer to this as moral authority. The glory that is being talked about here we'll define more specifically in a minute. The illumination is talking about not the kind of illumination you get when the sun comes up or a light is switched on, but mental and emotional illumination in the chambers of our thinking and feeling processes where this glory is going to illuminate. And the result of this is that this glory illumination has the effect of toppling Babylon. Babylon loses credibility in the wake of this more attractive way of thinking. Now, this is remarkable. What does glory mean then? Because this angel illuminates the world with glory. Now watch this. This is remarkable. This is the way the Bible uses the word glory, just so we know how the word is employed in this prophecy. So Psalm 97, verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his what? Glory. It's talking about God, and this is a Hebrew method of poetry in which the first statement is defined by the second. It's a looping technique. So in the text, grammatically, glory is equivalent to righteousness. The righteousness of God's character is God's glory, but the idea is bigger than that. Psalm 115, verse 1, not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name be, there's our word again, glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. So now that we understand how this Hebrew form of poetry works, we know that what we're seeing here is that glory is equivalent to God's what? His mercy and his truth. Watch this. Isaiah 28 verse 5 tells us, In that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of, here's our word again, glory, and for a diadem of beauty, for a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. This is remarkable. We're being told here that the glory of God is the beauty of God. The New Testament picks up the theme of glory and tells us in John 1.14 that the glory of God manifested, personified in Christ, is his grace and truth. Then at the birth of Jesus, in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, glory is equivalent to God's goodwill toward all of humanity. Glory to God in the highest, the angels sing, at the spectacle of the incarnation of God in the flesh, bringing goodwill to humanity. And then, at the very tippy top of the glory concept in Scripture is the cross of Calvary. Jesus, referring to his death at the cross, in which he would pour out his life's blood for you and me and for the whole world, Jesus said, he answered them, he said to the disciples, the hour has come, the hour has come that the Son of Man, that's himself, should be what? Glorified. And then in verse 32, and I, if I am lifted up on the cross, that is, will draw. So the glory of Jesus is manifested in the giving of his life 
for the life of the world. In other words, the glory of God is, in fact, the beauty and righteousness and goodness and mercy and truth of the character of God manifested in Christ. So, Revelation 18, 1 and 2 is a eschatological prophecy that's telling us that something has to happen in order to initiate the second coming. The final eschatological prophecy to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ is a global glory revolution. You know what you are? You know what I am? By commission, we sometimes call it the gospel commission. Here's a, here's, a, here's a job title for you. Here's a job title for me. What you are, what I am, you are a fame agent for Jesus. Your whole goal in life is to magnify his beauty, to magnify his glory, and to make him famous in the minds and hearts of human beings. To clear up the misconceptions of God's character that Babylon has imposed upon human minds regarding God, to lift the darkness, to lift the veil, from doctrines like eternal torment and predetermination, predestination, stripping human beings of free choice to love God. The entire psycho-edifice of Babylon will come down in the light of the gospel. And the goal of the church of God in these last days is to topple that system with a pure theology that glorifies the character of God. Or let's say it this way. I'm going to summarize now. Babylon in eschatological prophecy is the system that engages its power, its system, its theological system, its ecclesiastical system. Babylon is the system that engages in the uglification of the character of God. Don't look up the word uglification. (laughs) I made it up. How do you think words get birthed? If you need a word and there isn't one, you make it up. Okay, so Babylon is the system that uglifies the character of God through false doctrines that make God look like the kind of God that can only be served out of fear or be denied with unbelief. If you look at the Babylonian system... You can only either be a slave to God or your misconception of God or walk away in atheism because it's untenable. But the glory revolution that's coming is a glory to God revolution that beautifies the character of God before the world. Now, what I'm here to share with you this week is a piece of that beautification of the character of God. And we're calling it covenant identity. Covenant identity. Now, I've been on a journey the last couple of years, and that journey has resulted in a book that I just saw here at 3BN, actually, yesterday. It just, it just got published. And this book is available. I'm not a Cole Porter. I'm not a literature evangelism, evangelist. I don't care if you buy it, but I think you should. Um, this book is opening, has opened to my mind the beauty of God's character on an unprecedented level. Now, what is meant by this title? The title of the book is The Sonship of Christ. The Sonship of Christ. And the subtitle is Exploring the Covenant Identity of God and Man. The journey for me began with a problem. All over the world, wherever I was going, people were asking the same basic question. In fact, somebody right in a grocery store in College Dale, Tennessee, Um, stopped me in the salsa aisle and said, hey, and this was the question, have you heard of the anti-Trinitarian thing that's going on, the anti-Trinitarian movement? Is the Trinity a false doctrine, a pagan doctrine, or a true doctrine? Is Jesus the Son of God in some kind of eternal sense, or did Jesus begin to exist at some point in history? And this was the question. And there's a tension in Scripture. For example, for example, track with me here. Here's the problem. Let's set ourselves up with a problem to solve. On the one hand, most popular verse in Scripture, John 3, 16, Jesus is called God's only begotten Son. Now, if you just look at the text and all you have, listen very carefully now, if all you have is this passage or if you block your vision outside of the parameters of the passage. You don't look anywhere else. You just look at the text and you analyze it 
like up close in a forest looking at the bark on a tree and think you see the forest. If you look at the text, you may reason, well, it says he's the son, and then God is the one who is the father, and we know that a father and a son don't coexist concurrently chronologically. A father has to precede the son. Therefore, Jesus must have come into existence at some point in some form. We don't know exactly how, but there had to be a point when he didn't exist, and then he began to exist. Now, connected with this idea is the idea that if Jesus began to exist at some point in eternity past, in some form, call it birth, call it creation, call it whatever you want to call it, but he didn't exist as a second person from the Father, and then he began to exist as a freestanding person from the Father. However you want to splice that. If that's true, we're down to the Father and the Holy Spirit, but the same movement says, well, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father, and therefore not a third person that coexists eternally with the Father and the Son. So this is, this is the reasoning if you look at the text on its own. But then you have a little bit of a problem, and here's the problem you end up with that, that is difficult to deal with. The same scripture that calls Jesus God's Son explicitly tells us that Jesus is none other than God. Not only just God in passing, as the Jehovah's Witnesses do with John chapter 1, where they translate it a God with a lowercase g, as though he weren't God inherently, but was made God, which has all kinds of implications for spiritualism. Because if any created or begotten or actualized being could be deified, then the rest of us are open to the possibility of deification. If it's possible to be brought into existence and then to be made divine, then what's to stop us in our thinking from going the direction of believing that we are capable of being deified? But that's a trail to go on the subject. All we're going to say now on the subject is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, the NIV says, being in very nature God, didn't consider it something to be, be held onto or grasped, or he didn't consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God. In very nature God, equal with God. Now this is fascinating. The Bible is full of both sets of statements. Son of God, God. Great is the mystery of godliness. Speaking of the incarnation, God was manifested in the flesh. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the angel tells Joseph and Mary, call this child that was just born of you, call him Emmanuel, God with us. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 explicitly calls the one who will be born of Mary the everlasting Father, which throws us for a loop. Everlasting God. Revelation chapter 1 calls him the Almighty. He called himself in John chapter 8 the I Am that interacted with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all the Old Testament patriarchs and prophets. So you have all of this language that explicitly states that he is God, very God. How is it that he could be God in any kind of eternal sense that we comprehend deity and have not existed at some point in the remote past and then somehow been birthed, brought forth, actualized, call it whatever you want, didn't exist, then he did as a freestanding person from the Father. How do you reconcile? This is the problem. How do you reconcile these identities? Well, what's been helpful for me is to back up from the bark on the tree, to pan out. I've been saying to myself for 10 years now or so, when in doubt, regarding Bible study, when in doubt, pan out. <laughs> if you don't know what a particular verse is saying or you're getting befuddled by analyzing or micromanaging words in a single verse, 
Pan out from the single verse. Stop micromanaging words and verses. Pan out and grasp the panorama. So I'm going to suggest to you that Scripture is not a systematic theology textbook. Now, I'm not down on systematic theology. I do it myself. But the book itself is not systematic theology. You can derive systematic theology from the book. I'll tell you what else the Bible is not. The Bible is not a proof text manual. It's not an arsenal of verses to be mobilized to prove any particular doctrine. Now, you can use it that way, but that's not what the thing itself is. What is the thing itself? The Bible's a story. It is a narrative. It, is a narr- it has a beginning. <laughs> it has a middle. It has an end. And at the beginning, you realize it's going somewhere. And where is it going? From Genesis, it's going somewhere. Where is it going? It's going to Jesus in the most crystal clear, beautiful sense imaginable. So, so let's look at the Bible as a story, as a story for a minute. Let's pan out. Our question is, what is this language that we find in the New Testament that Jesus is the Son of God? What is this language that he is, Paul even says, the firstborn son of God? What is this language? He's the begotten or only begotten son of God. Well, go all the way back to the beginning of the story. And this is just mind-blowing and so beautiful. Watch this. At the beginning of the story, Genesis 1.27, we're told that God created man in his own what? Image. I'm highlighting the words created and image. God's up to something. He's created his image. Now, the man and the woman compose this image in totality, but the man here in the text, watch this, the man in the text, if you run forward in the biblical narrative, you come to Luke chapter 3 and the genealogy of Jesus, where Luke is trying to crack the riddle of his identity. Luke is trying to tell us who he is that has just been born into this world. Luke says, well, let me tell you who he is. Let me tell you who he is. Here's his genealogy. Have you ever ever wondered why the genealogies? All they do is put us to sleep on Sabbath afternoon. Nobody's ever read them start to finish. Well, maybe you have. If you read them start to finish, you'll find that there is an internal narrative logic to the genealogies. Jesus is being introduced to us in the Gospel of Luke by telling us the story of humanity. And each person in the genealogy is the son of some, listen carefully, human father. David's the son of Jesse, who's the son of Obed. And it just keeps going back and back until you get to Adam. And there's no human being before him to name. So it goes all the way back. So-and-so is the son of so-and-so, who's the son of so-and-so, who's the son of so-and-so, who's the son of... Adam, who's the son of God. There's our language. There's our language. Okay, so Adam is the son of God in a unique sense, in a primary sense. All of us are sons and daughters of God by procreation. Adam and Eve by creation. Adam and Eve didn't have human parents. Are you with me so far? We don't even know if they had belly buttons because you'd have to have a mom or dad for that unless God put them there for aesthetic purposes, (laughs) right? Because it would look weird if you didn't have a belly button. So you got Adam and Eve, right? You got Adam and Eve, and Adam is the son of God. Listen, Adam is the son of God in a unique primary sense. Now watch this. God created man in his own image. This guy's name is Adam. That's Genesis 1. But look at Genesis 5. Here's the logic of the story from the get-go. And Adam, here's our language, begot a what? Son in his own likeness after his image. So you have a pattern that is initiated at the beginning of the story. What's the pattern? Creation, procreation. God creates the first man, the first woman, and then the first man, the first woman, they begin a genealogical process of procreation. Yes or no? Yes. This is the pattern of the story. This is Genesis. Now, as the story unfolds, 
we realize that sonship is the means by which image is transmitted. The whole point of the story, that's why when you get to the New Testament and you're reading about Jesus in the book of Romans, Paul says, by the way, he's the son of God and the image of God from whom will come many brethren. What? Well, when you come to Romans, you realize that Jesus is the mulligan for the fall of the human race. He's the do-over. Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is initiating a new genesis, a new beginning, because the image of God was lost, and so Adam lost the capacity for transmitting from generation to generation the image of God. So what is the fall of mankind in this context? The fall of mankind is the loss of God's image, but more than that, it is the loss as well of the capacity to procreate God's image, generation to generation. There was an interruption in the process of the transmission of God's image from father to children and onward down through the ages. So you realize that something's going on here. The story has a shape to it. Genesis 3.15 is when God comes and he says, this is what I'm going to do in order to rectify the fall. This is what I'm going to do. And he's speaking to the serpent who tempted our first parents to sin. He's speaking to Satan in the presence of Adam and Eve and specifically wants us to understand what now has to happen. Now listen. Genesis 3.15, put it in your notes, put it in your mind. It is the first gospel promise, and it is the first gospel prophecy. It is a prophecy promise, a promise prophecy. It is both messianic, it foretells the coming of the Savior as the Son of God, and it foretells, listen, the complete defeat of Satan in an eschatological finality. Now watch this. Here's the promise. Here's the prophecy. This is the first thing out of God's mouth in describing the plan of salvation. I will put enmity, that word means hostility, between you, Satan. God is addressing Satan here. I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's Eve in the local historical primary sense. But as the story unfolds, womankind takes on eschatological significance, and Israel itself becomes a corporate woman, a corporate bride. And then the church in the New Testament becomes a corporate eschatological bride. So God is saying, I'm going to put enmity, hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, watch this, and the woman, that's Eve locally, eschatologically, Israel and the church, and between, here's the language, your offspring and hers offspring your offspring and hers you've heard the term no doubt the spawn of satan never ever use that to describe somebody you're upset with it has prophetic serious theological implications what's happening here in this passage is we're being told that two lineages will be initiated from Genesis down through the ages. Two theological lineages. Two lineages that carry an opinion, a view, a perspective on the character of God. A false theological system will be initiated and carried on down through the ages, and a true theological system will be initiated and carried on down through the ages. The prophecy is saying that Satan will be defeated, and notice the language. It says this enmity between the woman and Satan, between your offspring and hers. Now, note the language. He, now it's singular. He, a singular offspring, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. God is saying to the serpent, you have no idea what's coming your way. Somebody's going to be born of the woman, a singular individual, there are going to be a lot of sons and daughters, a lot of procreation, 
but a singular he, a singular offspring, eventually will be born. And you will wound him in the process of him crushing you and completely defeating your kingdom. He will be wounded, you will be completely defeated. This is the mother of all prophecies. This is the initiating of both a messianic and an eschatological foretelling of what's going on, what's going to be going on, and reach its climax with that prophecy in Revelation 18 that we began with. Now, as Genesis 3.15 foretells the prophecy, the prophecy is telling us that there's going to be an offspring, right? Are you in the story now? We're, we're backing up from systematic theology. We're, we love it. We're backing up from proof texting. We're fine with proof texting as long as our proof texting is in context, okay? But we're backing up right now. We're saying, oh, oh, what's going on in the story of Scripture? Well, Genesis 3.15 foretells an offspring. So what do you think God is going to do next? Well, exactly what he said he was going to do. He's initiating a lineage. A genealogical lineage is going to unfold, right? So God calls a guy named Abraham, along with Sarah, out of Ur, of the Chaldeans, out of Babylon, you guys, which is then reconstituted eschatologically in the books of Daniel and Revelation. So Abram and Sarai come out of Babylon, and God's covenant promise is, I'm using the word affirmed, not created. I'm saying affirmed because where do we know the promise has its roots? Genesis 3.15. So God isn't, isn't promising anything to Abraham that he hasn't already promised. The promise, the covenant promise is now expanding with Abraham. So the covenant is affirmed with Abraham. Okay, now watch this. And a sonship lineage is established. God says, Abraham, Sarah, here's what's going to happen you're going to have a son. And your son will be the son of promise, the son of the covenant. And that son is the one that I'm going to carry forth the covenant mission with. So God tells Abram, listen, here's what's going to happen. Genesis 12, verse 3, in you, that is in your seed, in your offspring, in your lineage, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is Genesis 3.15 magnified. Messiah is going to come through the lineage of Abraham eventually, and the result is going to be some kind of universal global effect. Think again, Revelation 18.1. The earth was lightened with his glory, the whole earth lightened with his glory, a global viral movement of blessing. The whole earth will be blessed in the Messiah. So Abraham and Sarah say, well, that means we need to have a son, and we're getting up there in years. In fact, Sarah finds it hilarious to think that Abraham can pull this off. And so she makes a suggestion... <laughs> And he buys the suggestion. I don't know what you're thinking right now. <laughs> he pulled it off. She couldn't. If you read, anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is this. They were old. That's the point. And so they do the whole thing with the handmaiden and get Ishmael. This is a fascinating twist in the narrative. Technically, Ishmael is Abraham's firstborn son. But covenantally, he's not. So God says to Ishmael, he's a fine little boy. I don't know if God said that, but that's not him. I said that the promise was going to be filled, fulfilled through you and Sarah, not you and Hagar. So Isaac comes along. And Isaac is really the second born 
but he is the covenant child. He's the narrative child. He's the child, he's the son that will carry the lineage forward. So all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham, and then comes Isaac, and Isaac is explicitly called the son of promise in Scripture. Isaac is explicitly called, by the way, the only begotten son in the book of Hebrews, the only begotten son of Abraham. Abraham, I think, had seven, eight, nine sons. Count them in Genesis. Isaac was by no means Abraham's only begotten son. But in the covenantal sense, you can say with theological accuracy that Isaac was the only begotten covenant son. He's the only begotten son of promise. And then comes Jacob. Now, Jacob was supposed to be the firstborn. I mean, his brother was actually the firstborn technically. Jacob is the secondborn technically, chronologically. But Jacob becomes the firstborn, the child of promise, the son of the covenant. Again, emphasizing that God isn't super concerned with chronological birth. God is concerned with character, message, purpose, plan, covenant. And that's the thing that is being woven through history. And then Jacob, watch where the story goes now. Jacob has how many sons? Twelve sons. They collectively reproduce and become a nation called Israel. They take the name of Jacob, their father, after his wrestling match with the Lord, and God changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, one who prevails with God. So now, watch this. Israel becomes God's corporate son. Watch the language now. When Israel is in Egyptian bondage for some 400 years, Notice that God comes to Moses in Exodus 4, 22 and 23, and God uses very specific language in his address to Pharaoh through Moses. God says, Israel, he's talking through Moses to Pharaoh, Israel is my what? My son, my firstborn. Israel, the nation. The corporate body is God's firstborn son. So I say to you, let my son go. We're beginning to realize that you can't interpret the sonship language of the New Testament in a vacuum. That John 3.16 and all the other New Testament texts about Jesus being the son of God only have coherent meaning in the context of this narrative. In fact, all the language of the sonship of Christ in the New Testament is derived from Old Testament narrative, Old Testament passages. Here, Israel as a nation is called my son, my firstborn. In Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy, not Genesis, not Exodus, Deuteronomy is the first time in Scripture that God is called Father. And it's in a specific context. Moses is talking to Israel. He's reminding them of God's covenant promises and their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And Moses says to the children of Israel, is he not your what? Your father? God. Is God not your father? Well, what had God, we just read it in Exodus, what had God referred to Israel as a nation? What language did God use? You are my son, my firstborn son. God takes on the role of father to the nation of Israel apart from all the other nations who are being presided over by pagan deities, demon deities masquerading as gods. Is he not your father? Moses is speaking to Israel. And then they, the other nations, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. To gods they did not know, lowercase gods, which in this text are demons masquerading as gods. To new arrivals, to new gods, to new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Now watch this. Of the rock who what? Begot you. God is telling Israel, <laughs> I begot you. That is, 
I gave birth to you. And the birth of Israel was their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. It's not talking about chronological birth and sonship. It's not talking about ontological birth and sonship. It's talking about covenant identity. Israel is God's begotten son, and you were not mindful, and you forgot the God who fathered you. This is the origin of the language of God's fatherhood in the New Testament. It doesn't predate this occurrence in the biblical narrative. Before this, God is Yahweh and God is Elohim. But now God is telling a story, and he's carrying out a purpose, and that purpose is being carried forward down through history. So Moses essentially tells Israel, God is your father, Israel, as a nation. The other nations, they have their father gods, but God, the one and only true God, is your father. And Moses tells the children of Israel, you are God's only begotten son among the nations. Now back up and remember the prophecy promise of Genesis 3.15. Remember Abraham and Sarah called out so that through their lineage, how many nations of the earth would be blessed? All the nations. Listen, Israel was not called out to stay out, but to be sent in. Israel was called out to be the corporate son of God as a nation in order to witness to the other nations that would be incorporated into Israel and become nation sons of God as well. This is the plan of salvation unfolding. Well, there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and then there's King David. Well, you, you would expect the same kind of language to be used. And sure enough, Psalm chapter 2 David is called the anointed, the anointed, which is the word Messiah in the Hebrew. But here's what's fascinating. In Psalm 2, after being called God's king, God's anointed, David is called God's son. The Lord refers to him specifically as my son, and today I have begotten you, David. What? Didn't David have a mom and a dad, literally, biologically, chronologically, ontologically? Was not Jesse his father? God is not talking about ontology. God's not talking about chronology. God's talking about covenant. David, you're the one who I have now designated as my covenant continuation through history. You're the Messiah anointed one in the lowercase anointed, lowercase Messiah, lowercase king. You're the one who is the prototype of the coming capital M Messiah, capital A anointed, capital K king. You're the one, David. You are my son. And God says that David is his begotten son, his only begotten son because there is no other <laughs> And Psalm 89, same exact thing. It's a dual prophecy, just like Psalm 2. It's a messianic prophecy, and it's a prophecy about David. Here, we're, we read in Psalm 89, he shall cry out to me. That is David, King David, and later on the Messiah. It's a dual prophecy. Will cry out to me, you are my father. You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, quoting Deuteronomy 32, where the language comes from. Also, I will make him my firstborn. But note the language. God says of David, I will make him my firstborn. In a covenantal sense, it's a making. It's a designation. It's an assignment. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with biological beginnings. You're my firstborn and the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand with him. Him, King David. David's the one. There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, David. So there's a lineage that's unfolding. The story is being woven through history, and then comes Solomon. 
And Solomon is the son of David. David says to God, okay, now that my military career is at an end, I want to build a temple for the worship of God. And God says, you can't build a temple for my worship because you have blood on your hands. You're a man of war. God distances himself from force and coercion and violence. And he says, you can't build a temple for me. It's got to be a man of peace. And Solomon means peace. But notice how Solomon is described as the covenant promises woven forward. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 10. He shall build a house. He, that is Solomon, will build a house for my name, David. Not you, David, but your son. He will build. Solomon will build a house. And he, Solomon, shall be who? My son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his, Solomon's kingdom, over Israel for how long? Well, Solomon died and will not be the king of kings and lord of lords. This is both local historical and it is messianic eschatological. This is God saying, David, then Solomon. And Solomon, your throne is going to be a set. You're my son, but there's another son coming. Within the biblical narrative, here's the close for tonight. And I hope you're primed for tomorrow night. Okay? We're just setting the table right now. We're going to eat tomorrow night. Tonight, we, just, we were nibbling at this blueberry muffin. We're going to shove the whole thing in our mouth tomorrow night. So here's the conclusion for tonight. Within the biblical narrative, it is evident, if you pan out and look at the story, that sonship is a covenant identity and designation not an ontological identity. When we come to the New Testament and we encounter the Son of God in the person of Christ, the New Testament authors are not trying to tell us anything about how he began to exist in some eternal time prior to the beginning of the world. They're not answering Greek questions of metaphysics and ontology. They're answering Hebrew questions of covenant and narrative. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, your covenant son. May we be covenant sons and daughters of yours as well. And the conduit through which 